Great. Well, welcome everyone. Um, glad, very glad you could join us this evening for HTC's program. What are special districts with zoning expert George James uh, and co-sponsored by na our neighborhood partner Landmark West. Uh, if you don't know us, Historic Districts Council, we are the citywide advocate for New York's historic neighborhoods, working with more than 500 community-based organizations to preserve the places that matter to them. Uh, we conceived of this program for several reasons. One, this is part of HDC's 2024 Preservation Conference Series, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Government's Impact on Historic Neighborhoods. And we will definitely learn tonight how special districts impact historic neighborhoods. Um, you can watch free videos from our conference and sign up for our walking tours, upcoming walking tours around this theme on our website. And I'll put that link in the chat. Uh, we also became aware of how special districts may be impacted in the proposed City of Yes zoning text amendments, which will potentially radically change zoning in the City of New York, eliminating many permits, processes, and restrictions in an effort to encourage growth. Um, we're specifically concerned about City of Yes for economic opportunity, um, the proposed language that privileges uniformity um, in the city at the expense of special district design regulations. Um, but I'm gonna let George talk more about this as the expert. Um, so for, with that, I'm gonna um, turn things over to Sean Corson, the Executive Director of Landmark West, who's going to introduce himself and our speaker for this evening. Thank you everyone, thank you, Frampton. Uh, yes, I'm with Landmark West and we are your grassroots good government preservation and land use organization. We serve 59th Street to 110th Street and scenic landmark Riverside Park through scenic landmark Central Park. And we're excited to be here tonight co-hosting with HDC. Uh, why we are here is exactly as Frampton said, because of the upcoming City of Yes programming uh, being pushed through the various entities in the city right now. If you mark your calendars for the 8th, that's next Monday, it's gonna be come right before City Council for a hearing. This is City of Yes for Economic Opportunity, the second leg of the suite. So the zoning text itself is over 1,100 pages. And one of the key parts in this, which is really just a side item, slashes through most of the protections uh, for special districts. Special districts began in 1969 following the 1961 zoning, which you'll learn about tonight. And Landmark West in our catchment area has the Lincoln Square Special Purpose District, which was the very first of the 64 districts uh, in the city. Uh, this These changes, which will uh, homogenize a lot of areas as the city attempts to Marie Kondoize the planning text, uh, will really be affecting Manhattan more than anywhere else, in part because we have the, the lion's share of the districts. There's 28 special purpose districts in Manhattan alone. As we mentioned, this was the first. We'll get into all those details tonight. If you have a question, please put it in the chat or at the end of the uh, presentation, you can raise your hand and ask it live. Uh, it's one of the many details we'll be covering with tonight's speaker, George Janes. George Janes is founder of George M. Janes & Associates, a specialty planning firm with an expertise in zoning, simulation, visualization, statistics, and quantitative modeling. He's known as the translator of many a great many zoning proposals. He's helped numerous community groups, uh, neighborhood preservation organizations, community boards, and everyday New Yorkers better understand what's being proposed for the world around them and how that legislation, those excerpts, those comments all get codified and then may, may manifest themselves onto the streets and impact their daily lives. Uh, without further ado, George, for what are special districts? That's great. Thank you, Sean. I'm going to share my screen and hopefully this will work. All right. Excellent. All right. So when Frampton and Sean asked me to do uh, a session on special purpose districts, it was the first time I've ever been asked to do this. And so I was like, well, where do I start? And I came back to, well, where you always start is you start at the beginning. <laughs> um, so New York City is adopted the nation's first zoning code in 1916. And this picture right here of the equitable building, it's whenever anybody talks about zoning, they show this picture because this was kind of the spark of it, right? The This building was built, built 42 stories tall, right at the street line. Um, this, this building and also its neighbors, to be fair, essentially covered the skies and 
darkened the streets and made the streets um, in lower Manhattan very dark. Um, and at the time, the city agreed that the impact of development on private property, on other properties, and the public needed to be managed through zoning. And so they passed the zoning resolution. The 1916 zoning resolution was just 12 pages long. Um, but it was revolutionary. Uh, a resolution regulating and limiting the height and bulk of buildings and regulating and determining the area of yards, courts, and other open spaces and regulating and restricting the location of trades and industries and the location of buildings designed for specific uses. And they did all that in 12 pages. And part of that was the, the simplicity was how they did the, the, the building heights. Um, and so this is, this is the uh, proposed building height map from 1916. It changed over time. Um, but essentially what you're seeing here is a number uh, that ranged from one to two and a half. And essentially if your building was in a one and a half district, it could rise up one and a half times the width of the street. So the width of the street and these numbers determined the, 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 the front wall height of your building. And you'll see that much of the city was in a one and a half district. Um, Midtown was in a two, lower Manhattan was two and a half. The shorelines were two, uh, but most of it was this one and a half district. And so what that meant was if you were on a wide street, you could be taller than if you were on a narrow street. And that is a pattern that we set into place in 1916 that we carry forward today. And it was so simple, right? You know, you're regulating the, the, the front wall height based upon the street width. And, and this concept is completely shaped the city. I, I like using Park Avenue here because you have this, 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 even sort of historic form um, that that frames the street. And now above the base height, uh, buildings had to set back and create this wedding cake sort of style. And you know, once the building was at twenty five percent of the lot, there was no height limit for commercial buildings, and so you could have buildings like the Empire State Building or the Chrysler Building um, extend up as tall as they wanted to. There is no floor area limitation. It was just that if you covered a small portion of your lot, you were free to go as tall as you wanted. And that form um, essentially is the kind of iconic New York City skyscraper, which really shaped um, our city. You know, it was, a, it was a product of zoning. You know, we had regulations that wasn't an accident that um, we have buildings like the Chrysler Building and others that follow this sort of um, wedding cake style and um, narrow tower form. But of course, turns out that 12 pages wasn't enough to deal with the complexities of New York City. And it really, it was immediately after zoning was adopted, we started amending it. And by mid-century, there was agreement that there are so many amendments of this and we needed new zoning and it was really, um, didn't focus on the things that were important at the time. And so New York City developed a plan for rezoning and then draft zoning text. The plan for zone, rezoning was um, uh, published in 1950. Um, the draft Voorhees zoning text was from August 1958. And you know, there was a lot of wrangling, you know, it's New York City, it's real estate, it's zoning. Um, and there was a lot of arguing and discussions. And then finally, in December 1961, um, the our current, our, our new zoning resolution was adopted, right? It had much more detail on uses, introduced the concept of floor area ratio, um, regulating size as well as height. Um, carried forward the idea of sky exposure planes and, and street widths to preserve light and air. Um, it eliminated the things that were considered bad at the time, which is essentially um, small courts and yards, basement apartments, 
um, encouraged the good, which was open space, off street parking, plazas, and so on. Oops, sorry. At 260 pages, the new zoning reflected the values of the time. And, you know, at that time, we believed that tenements were bad and that the new zoning that was being adopted would rebuild a new city um, with homes surrounded by trees and grass and parking for the cars that everybody seemed to be buying. I'm showing Stuyvesant Town here because not because it was made by zoning, it was it predated the 1961 zoning, um, but it was a model for the R72 district, which was in zoning. Essentially, this is a built out R72 district. Um, and so essentially, the form of Stuyvesant Town shaped the zoning we adopted afterwards. And R72 was the most common Manhattan residential district in 1961. Now, it was generally accepted as fact that the city's form was bad. It was bad for your health. It was bad for the economy. It was bad for the society. And it's not an ivory tower concept, right? It, this, is, this is Superman saying that it's not your fault that you're delinquent. It's these slums, these poor living conditions. If there was only some way um, someone could remedy it. And you know what? Who remedied it? It was Superman. He was, in many issues, he is rebuilding the areas so that people don't have to live in slums. Um, and I, I show three of these just to say that you know, we adopted zoning that essentially said we were going to demolish much of the city and rebuild it better. And it was a very deeply held opinion at the time. Um, and I'm showing this to show how deep and how far it went. Um, the 1961 resolution painted the city with a broad brush, right? One zoning district could cover miles. Brooklyn especially got these R6 districts. What is an R6 district? Well, this is an R6 district where you have a building surrounded by open space with parking on it. This is an R6 building constructed under the 1961 regulations. This was the urban future that we saw for great swaths of Brooklyn. Well, it didn't take long for people to realize that generic zoning just didn't work well in some places and that context actually mattered. Um, when this building went up, well, there, there are a couple of others, um, the folks on Park Avenue, when they saw buildings like this one going up, where you have this uniform um, street wall height, and then we had these towers going up with plazas in front that that broke the um, continuity of the street. And it's like people who lived on Park Avenue were like, what the hell did you do to Park Avenue? And so that, from that need, was this special purpose district was born. So we spent all of this time developing new zoning that generically and conceptually was fine, but when you apply it to certain places that you like, um, didn't work. And so New York City developed the concept of the special purpose district. And, and simply, um, it's, it's simply a set of custom zoning rules that sit on top of the underlying zoning and that apply only to a specific geography. Um, they're supposed to reflect a unique condition, a special character or planning or policy objective or some combination of these things. Um, the first one, as has been said, was adopted in 1969 and was the special Lincoln Square District. And it was designed to preserve, protect, and promote the character of the special Lincoln Square District area as a location of a unique cultural and architectural complex, an attraction which helps the city of New York to achieve preeminent status as a center for the performing arts and thus conserve its status as an office headquarters center 
and a cosmopolitan residential community. That that's in the zoning. <laughs> that's why they did this. It's it's part of the purpose of of why they put this together, and and that was part of the zoning that they they adopted. After Lincoln Square, there were many, many more special purpose districts developed. I, by my count, I was counting them there. I think there are about 71 right now. And if you look, you know, large swaths of the city still have none. But, you know, there are big ones uh, on Staten Island. Midtown covers an enormous area. Um, and some of them are small. Some of them are large. And they have all of the kinds of regulations like things that you would find in special districts that are something some really unexpected like right? this one is real weirdly specific for example uh, for the purpose of applying the provisions of this section the residential development goal shall be met when at least 3865 dwelling units have been developed within the special east harlem corridors district that's hard coded into the zoning right now. This number is like so. There's a section of zoning that says you can only use this section of zoning when 3,865 dwelling units have been developed since this zoning was adopted. It's just very weirdly specific. Uh, but you know, there was a planning goal that they wanted to uh, meet, and they that's how they wrote it in here. And sometimes the rules are confusing. Um, people might expect a zoning district like R8 to have a similar meaning everywhere. But special districts can and do change the basics of the underlying zoning district. So, for example, an R8 in parts of the Clinton Special District, Clinton Special District, I, I would call Hell's Kitchen, but um, it's essentially the west part of uh, Manhattan. Um, the R8 in parts of the Clinton Special District are limited to 4.2 FAR, meaning the size of the building, and 85 feet in height. Um, and, you know, essentially it's mapped on the avenues, like 9th Avenue is mostly um, this special district and R8. And, and this is what it looks like in the special district. But a few blocks to the north, R8, can, can produce a completely different type of building. This is not in the Clinton Special District. It does not have an 85 foot height limit, but it's also an R8 building. This is 200 Amsterdam at 668 feet tall. More than just form though, special districts can be super specific on use. Little Italy has had its own special purpose district since 1977. And the iconic nature of Little Italy is protected by its special purpose district. The uses in, permitted in Little Italy are specifically selected uses to strengthen the existing commercial character of the area. So in zoning, there's like 50 pages of specific uses. And in 1977, we went through and picked out the types of uses that would be appropriate in Little Italy and made a special use group called LI. Um, it's a kind of specificity that was popular in the 1970s um, and into the 80s, but it's the kind of thing that you, the city is moving away toward from now. But, you know, I will say it's it's created or at least fostered or protected a uh, iconic New York City neighborhood. Um, but regardless of specifics, all the special purpose districts are designed to implement planning or preservation goals. So in the 1970s, most of the special districts were designed to protect and preserve. Um, the Special Park Avenue Improvement District or Park Improvement District um, was developed in 73 and was designed so that the, the form of the new buildings would be like the old buildings. So they put a couple of the big towers in the 1960s and early 1970s. And and then they, they're like, we don't want We don't want any of those towers. And we want buildings that look like the old buildings. And I picked out this photograph because 
the lighter colored building here, was built in 2013. Now, of course, its design had something to do with the Landmarks Preservation Commission, but the zoning essentially requires a building that, that looks like or fits in with the other buildings on Park Avenue. In 1974, the planned community preservation districts were designed to protect, protect large-scale areas, fresh meadows, Park Chester, Sunnyside Gardens, Harlem River Houses. These were large-scale developments um, that had, you know, a real designed campus. Um, the open spaces are as important to the design as the buildings. And essentially, if you want to make changes to the buildings or do infill, you have to get a special permit uh, in these areas. And the idea here was, was they wanted to, pre to preserve the design of the campuses on these um, for these uh, developments. And so they mapped these um, special districts on them in 1974. But more recent ones are usually designed to support rezonings for more housing. Um, two recent ones, East Harlem and Jerome Avenue, um, they were, both of these areas were rezoned, um, one in 2017 and the other 2018 with mandatory inclusionary housing. And these special purpose districts um, supported those rezonings with special bulk and use regulations to promote new housing. Uh, this is one of the buildings developed in East Harlem, whoops, at um, 127th Street and Park Avenue. And, you know, it's a very large building for this part of East Harlem, but it is um, has at least 25% uh, affordable housing. And that's what was uh, done at the time to essentially promote affordable housing and requiring it in every single new building. And when I say affordable housing, I mean rent regulated housing uh, because it's not necessarily affordable to everyone, but it is all rent regulated. Sometimes new house, new zoning that we're seeing in special districts is being tested before the changes are being rolled out citywide. Um, and so, you know, you think about special districts as a laboratory to try out new zoning before um, you you adopt it citywide. Um, one of the greatest examples, I think, is the physical cultural establishments. So in the 1970s, the city said gymnasiums, dance studios, um, places like that had to get a special permit. They could not be cited as of right. Um, but that proved to be a big impediment for some of these uses. And the city was thinking about, about changing this requirement, but it did so first in a few special purpose districts. So like when they adopted East Harlem in, the, in, in 2017, they didn't require a special purpose for uh, gyms or physical culture establishments, as they say. And so they rolled that out in a couple of places and then boom, we get a citywide text amendment um, changing uh, or removing the special permit requirement for um, physical culture establishments. And so if you want to see what the city is planning for the future, you should always take a close look at what's in the new special districts, what's in there. Um, and, and parts of the city of yes for economic opportunity that was mentioned already, some of that proposal has zoning that already exists in special special districts and are being proposed citywide. One of them, for instance, is the changes to home occupations. Um, there are some districts where um, home occupations already can have multiple employees and be quite large. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to expand that those everywhere. Um, right now they exist in like Tribeca and, and uh, Soho Noho and a few other places, and they want to not now expand that everywhere throughout the city. Um, and then, as, as Frampton was saying, um, the City of Yes is looking to make major changes to the special, dis special district's urban design regulations. And DCP has said that urban design rules, custom to design to each special district, is complicated. Um, what they've said is that we don't need 70 different urban design rules, we need just a few. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna replace all of the urban design rules 
that we see in the special districts with the um, these few. They are A, B, and C, essentially, you know, most urban, less urban, um, and then least urban. Uh, and and this includes eliminating all the specific uses that help preserve the character of Little Italy, Madison Avenue, Lincoln Square. Um, so essentially, there's this idea that all the specificity and uses, it just makes things complicated and hard to use and difficult for owners to tenant their buildings. Um, and so the city has decided has, has said that they want to get rid of all that specificity and they want to let lots of different uses occupy the spaces in Little Italy or Madison Avenue. Um, and that's a that's a fairly significant change. I don't know if that's going to bring changes to those areas. Certainly it won't happen immediately, um, but it might be the kind of thing that happens over time. Zoning takes a long time to change, to develop, to change, and also to affect changes. Um, the city has called this a city of yes, a deregulation effort that will simplify zoning. And, you know, they are right. Um, it, it will simplify zoning, but the city is a city of neighborhoods um, that has, in many cases, largely rejected generic zoning. And so the question is really for everybody to think about is more generic zoning rules better? And is it appropriate to simplify the rules in this way? And I, I show Madison Avenue here. I'm, I'm not really a shopper, uh, but you know, Madison Avenue is an iconic shopping street. It is a iconic shopping street in part because it has lots of rules limiting what can occupy the ground floor. And so if you have a non-shopping use, um, yes, some of them can, but a lot of them, it has to be it has to fit in with the characters of a shopping street. And if they get rid of those rules, are, is, you know, how fast are these streets going to change? Probably not very fast, but it is a significant change to how we regulate these places. Um, the rules are complicated. They are right, but it, they create a place. So, so what's the future of zoning and special districts? So, the city administration, and really it has been for, you know, 15, 20 years now, um, it's really no longer in the mood for preservation. Um, we're not seeing uh, special districts designed to preserve. Um, and I don't think we're going to see any anytime soon, or at least not ones that are sponsored by the city. Um, we're still likely to see special districts, new ones, but they will be designed to encourage growth and development and implement elements of a plan for growth. Um, I know we're seeing one of those in um, in the Bronx, uh, near the train stations with the rezoning up there. There is, there's a new special district being proposed there to facilitate growth and development um, to support that rezoning effort. But, you know, you should all know that the city does consider private applications for rezoning actions. So Landmark West is the co-applicant to expand the special Lincoln Square District one block to the north. And as Sean can tell you, the process is time consuming, it's expensive, but it is possible given the right circumstance. Um, it is also unpredictable due to political considerations, as um, Sean and I found out recently. Um, nevertheless, you know, there it is a tool. Um, private applications are a thing. People can develop a private application for a new or expanded special purpose district. Um, and if folks are interested in doing something like that, there are rules. You know, if you have like, an existing special district that, that can be expanded, but you can't get the LPC interested in it. It's something that can um, be used to protect an area or apply rules, uh, special rules, special zoning rules in an area of special concern. Um, you know, that's all I have right now. 
I didn't want to get too far into this. I wanted to leave um, time for questions and discussion. Thank you very much, George. Uh, I appreciate that. I'm already having my inner professor in my ear thinking, oh, if it's too hard, just lower the standards. And here, if, if zoning is too hard, too hard to understand or figure out, let's just take away all the rules. Um, I guess what's hard for me to wrap my head around is zoning isn't there to upset anybody. It's not there to make your life more difficult. It's there to protect the people and basically give a shape to the street, a form to the buildings. Why is it okay that, why do we no longer need that? Do we not need to worry about light and air on the street anymore? Has something changed? Is the eclipse coming, affecting our minds? I think it's a very fair question. Um, yeah. yeah. I, I think it's always an issue of priorities, right? And, and administrations, the city, elected officials, um, they develop a set of priorities and uh, zoning is a land use policy and it can be used to affect those priorities. Um, in the 60s, 70s, in the 1960s, it was about reshaping the city. As we started to reshape the city, people were like, oh, my gosh, we're reshaping the city. And so we wanted to preserve the city. And then we in the 70s and 80s, we had a lot of preservation um, uh, special districts going into effect. And also, as you as you know, um, landmarks and, and special and, and historic districts were going into effect. But now in the uh, 2010s and 2020s, um, the city is really really focused in on housing and affordable housing. And so that is that is really um, the initiative, the uh, priority that shaping our zoning and zoning changes. Um, yes, light and air is still important, but people would say housing and affordable housing is more important. And I guess as we debate whether light and air or how important they are, it's hard to ignore the news, right? The New York Times just said that we lost 78,000 uh, people last year, and we've lost between 5 and 6% of the population since the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah. So why is there a crunch right now if we have the largest gut glut of office spaces in Midtown in the hemisphere and people are leaving? Why do we need the housing today? And I, I think it's, you know, listen, I, I, I've, I've been looking at those numbers with a lot of interest, right? Um, you have population decline since the 2020 census and, and the pandemic, um, yet you have uh, high, you have vacancies also decline in, in, um, in residential units. And so what's going on? I, I think there's, I, I don't know what's going on. I do know, however, an element which I've really been focused in on is what's been happening on the Upper East Side, Upper West Side, um, parts of Lower Manhattan, uh, Greenwich Village, um, where you have the shrinking of existing buildings. And but what, what I mean by that, shrinking by number of units. Um, the most obvious is the um, are the conversions of small tenements into single family homes. This happens all the time. You may not notice it because the building doesn't really change, but there's only one household occupying that building now instead of 10. Um, this has happened uh, near Central Park for a while, um, but it is now, um, you know, essentially spreading out from there. And, you know, probably larger numbers involve combinations of units. You know, it used to be that the in, the, in Manhattan especially, uh, Young people would move here, they would get a job, they'd find a significant other, and then partner up and move to the suburbs. Um, that was a pattern that existed for decades. You find more people staying in the city and raising their families here. Um, and that has put stress on schools. Um, it has also meant that a lot of apartments get combined. Um, two one-bedroom apartments next to each other get, get combined to a single unit. That means that the number of of households goes down, and whenever you combine a unit, that's that's a loss of a unit, right? And and we see that in a lot of the 
um, co-ops and condos, especially not not so much the rentals. Um, but that's that's a, that's something that I know it's happened in my building, um, and it continues to happen. And uh, I I think that's part of it. You know, people are big footing. You know, <laughs> you know, taking up lots of space. Um, and then finally, if I may, uh, you have these 86 and Madison Avenue. Um, there is a new building that went up that's 210 feet tall. It has 11 units in it. 11. Um, it has a 5,500 square foot average per unit. <laughs> it's astounding. It's astounding. You know, I, the ultra wealthy want to live in Manhattan. Um, okay. Um, but, you know, ultimately... They take up a lot of space. <laughs> no, this is not necessarily a special district question, but it came up again this weekend. Several board members were volleying an email about the Wall Street Journal piece. Uh, there were two row houses on 69th Street that had at least two years of blasting where they created a sub -ba a basement and a sub basement. It's now being up, put on the market for $85 million. The couple's divorcing. So these two joined row houses have never been occupied by them. And it was all speculative, essentially. And that's a case where, you know, 10 families were decanted from one building. So that's essentially at least 11 homes if the other one was always a private home. And now it's one. And we see this time and again. So there's no shortage of construction on the Upper West Side. It's just that very little, if any, of it's affordable. And so we keep hearing from the electeds, we need affordable housing. We need to take all these sweeping changes. We need to undo sp special purpose districts. When in reality, it's not solving the root problem that they're claiming. Oh, I I, I completely agree. I, I think there is this uh, false equivalence. Yeah, it depends on what neighborhood you're in, because this is not true everywhere. But uh, in Manhattan, um, there is this false equivalence between construction and um, and more more people, more units. It would, in fact, very often it's the reverse. Um, you know, the what's happened east of the park in that area over there where you have so many of the the units have been lost or shrunk i mean honestly the streets sometimes feel seasonal when the these folks who live in the neighborhood the few that are left you know decamp to their winter or summer homes um it's astounding how um how the uh the, the neighborhood feels different in august um and that's you know, I, I, I don't I don't know what the solution is. I would never suggest that I do. But I know that we aren't developing zoning solutions that address this at all. And we could. Um, there are ways that um, zoning could address um, the housing unit loss. You, they could address the idea of a um, maximum average unit size in a building, um, which, you know, you could still have your enormous unit, but it's got to be balanced out by units of normal size. Um, and so that way you would have, you know, a mix of unit types, which is, you know, a good planning goal. Um, you want housing for everybody, not just for one type of household. Thank you. Uh, we have a comment on the chat from George. Uh, I think that City of Yes is part of an overall deregulation movement, including Open New York and its PAC, Abundant New York, as well as the council member Botcher, uh, uh, Borough President Reynoso Group all in the name of housing, now for the first time, I think, including market rate luxury. Comment, please. And what are the other elements of City of Yes that we should be scared of, or maybe most aware of, on guard for, if I could hmm. rephrase that? Uh, okay, liberty. so there's, yeah, I mean, there's there's a, ph a philosophy, um, which is, you know, there's supply and demand, right? And so if you make more housing, um, you create more supply, then uh, you satisfy demand and, and, and you know, increase supply, meet the demand, prices drop. Um, that is a, you know, that's, that's a common thing that people believe. The problem is with it that I have not seen, and maybe, you know, somebody out there could educate me, is what is the demand in that equation, right? So supply and demand is an equation, right? So what is the demand for people who want to live in Manhattan? And I would say, well, you know, probably that demand is what, a billion? If we think about the globe, if 
All right, I'm off by an order of magnitude, maybe 100 million. It's a very large number. It is a number that can never be satisfied with supply solutions, in my opinion. And so you're creating units for a very large demand. And, and you know, what do you have in your control? Well, you have the size of the units. Um, you have subsidies that you could provide for affordable housing. You have, you know, ways of generating affordable housing through regulation. And I think those types of techniques are, are absolutely things that need to be, you know, implemented, explored, evaluated. But I, you know, this... The market will not save us. And I think that's what we've learned over the past many years is that market-based solutions are not a solution to housing for regular people. Um, what we end up with is housing, you know, 11 units in a 210-foot building. It's my personal opinion. Um, I'm not a housing expert. I'm a zoning person. But I do live in the neighborhood, and I do know what I see. Um, oh, and then uh, the second part of that question had to do with City of Yes. So so there were three components of City of Yes. Um, the first one, which had to do, deal with um, carbon neutrality, um, solar panels, battery uh, storage systems. Uh, that passed. It's done. Uh, essentially allows for much bigger bulkheads and solar panels on rooftops. Uh, that passed uh, City Council in December. There were some changes, some important changes that City Council made. Yay, City Council. Uh, but it's largely intact. Um, City of Yes for Economic Opportunity is being heard by City Council on um, Monday. Uh, written comments will be accepted until Thursday. If you have comments, uh, you should either make them in writing or on, on Monday. Um, and then the next one is... City of Yes for housing opportunity. And that's going to be a big one, right? I mean, <laughs> economic opportunity was over a thousand pages long. I think housing opportunity is going to be um, over a thousand pages long. I, it's, it's going to require a full environmental review. Uh, so we got to see a lot more d detail um, in the environmental scoping documents. And it's got a lot of stuff in there that... Um, uh, some of which I was really surprised to see. Uh, it's uh, happy, you know, that's another session though, right? Uh, happy to talk about it, but not <laughs> not right now. So one of the things you said in your presentation, we learned from Superman, it's the building's fault that people are the way they are. Generic zoning doesn't work. Did we just forget all this? Have, or we just want to bury it because it's inconvenient? And the other underlying comment was, that you mentioned was the need to rebuild the city because it was all wrong. Do you yeah. think that's the base role here? This is all a demolition derby? Oh, you know, I I don't want to ascribe motives to folks. I know that a lot of people believe that, um, you know, market-based solutions are the way to go. I, I, I disagree, right? And I, I like to think that their motives are, you know, they want to do the right thing. I just don't think that they're, I just don't think that they're using the right data or or decision making uh, to make that, um, you know, essentially to make that uh, argument rationally. However, I will say, you know, New York is a real estate town, Sean. You know this, right? Um, real estate, and and, it, and as my mentor said, and it has always been thus. Right? It has been a real estate town um, since the 19th century, at least, and maybe even longer. And, and, you know, there's a lot of real estate interests that want to see more development, more development, more development. And the idea that market-based solutions are fitted neatly with the interests of the real estate industry, I don't think is a coincidence. Agreed. <laughs> there's another comment in the chat here from Lynn Funk. Uh, what is an example of a special district that works well and may be compromised by the deregulation being discussed? Oh, I, I'd like the Madison Avenue special district. Um, Mad it's called the Madison Avenue Preservation District. Um, and, and it does two things. 
one, it's, you know, these curated listing of uses um, that create a shopping street. Again, I'm not a shopper, uh, but it's a street that I know a lot of people really like. Um, and when you walk down it, it has, you know, it, it's beautiful. It's a beautiful street, a beautiful walking street. Um, it also has uh, bulk regulations that create this kind of um, pyramid building form at the very top. The buildings that get developed there, I, I think, look really elegant and interesting. Um, they're large. They're, uh, you know, it's an R10 district, the highest density district. Uh, but the bulk regulations, um, you know, are in context and in scale for, for the area. Now, the, the, the change... It, the change that City of Yes is going to do is it's not going to change the bulk regulations, but it is going to change the use regulations. So, for instance, um, instead of just like the shopping street with, you know, restaurants and other supporting types of, of uses on the ground floor, you'll be able to do nightclubs, um, music venues, um, amusements, rides, uh, things that are, you know, for entertainment only right uh you could have things like um these uh you know last mile delivery hubs which i'm not sure that they would end up on madison avenue i mean i talked to you know people on madison avenue they go why would those uses uh, you know be here um you know it's a high rent district and i say you know for zoning you can't think about this year next year or five years from now this zoning is in place for decades it's in place for generations until somebody thinks to change it right and so you're planning not only for this year and next year but for 20 years and for 40 years from now remember we implemented madison avenue in the 70s right it's more than 40 years ago um, and now it's going to be the first change to it is to add all of these uses to it and I think that has a risk. Um, it's a risk of not only not not for tomorrow, but for 10, 15, 20 years from now. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Does anybody want to unmute or raise their virtual hand through the reactions tab in your toolbar? You can ask it live. I think everyone's just overwhelmed, George. <laughs> Thank you. There's one more question in the chat. Yeah. Uh, Beth Rosenblum, it's troubling that preservation is no longer a priority as I, as I worry that will exasperate and accelerate the destruction of the beautiful, unique, classic New York architecture and street vistas, and that the city will lose a lot of its historical charm. How can we reprioritize preservation? Well, it's, it's, it's a political question, right? I, I mean, essentially, the, the electeds, the mayor, the, the council members, um, they're the ones that set the agenda, the political agenda. And as you've learned um, from your own elected official on the Upper West Side, who essentially stopped our application because it didn't have affordable housing in it. Um, and affordable housing has been has become really the most important policy question of the city. Um, preservation is way down on that list and in very often seen as um, an impediment to housing and as actually is, you know, sometimes contrary um, to it, meaning people are fighting against preservation as opposed to supporting preservation. And ultimately, that listing of priorities is, is developed by elected officials and, ult and ultimately, the elected officials serve you all. So if you have opinions and you believe that preservation needs to be more important, then you need to make yourself be heard, um, either individually or through your community-based organizations that push for these things. I mean, that's that's just how it's done in the big city. <laughs> Thank you, George. We've got one more question from Linda. Hi, uh, well, it's more of a comment. Uh, first of all, George, you are amazing. And I've seen a few of your things in our community board meetings and here, and I've learned a lot and Thank it's you. really depressing. <laughs> and I don't know, I'm thinking about, is there anything in this that I really like? And I don't think so. 
but thank you very much for depressing me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> and I think, you know, HCC and Landmark West will continue to rely on George's expertise as we develop our testimony and the way that we're going to be responding to things like City of Yes. So, you know, again, I want to thank George tonight for all his expertise, Sean and Landmark West for co-hosting this event. Um, as some of you may know, you know, we sent out an advocacy alert recently about Parkchester, which was one of our 2022 Six to Celebrate neighborhoods, not a landmark district, but the special district um, there helps protect the special character of that large neighborhood um, and the light and air and the development of how that is laid out. So, you know, we see this as a preservation tool. Um, the special districts can be used as preservation tools when, especially, you know, in places where things are not linked um, and designated. So we'll be in touch with you um, about the, about our next steps on Parkchester and other responses to City of Yes for housing opportunity with uh, when that zoning text amendment comes out. Um, and I think we're going to close that. George, you had a comment? You're on mute. Just with that, Brent, but could you and Sean also circulate what we can and should do before the hearing on Tuesday? Maybe. Monday, yes. Right, yeah. Monday? Um, well, Tuesday yeah, is the Monday. hearing, right? So Monday, the 8th. Monday, the 8th. Yeah. Oh, it is Monday. Oh. Okay, then even yeah. sooner. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we will follow up with all, all our attendees tonight um, and reshare our testimony, can, can, yeah, which I think is still it? relevant, to share can with you, all your council members. Can you do it to the whole list, you guys? You can yes. talk about it amongst yourselves, but if we want yes. to turn people out, I, I think this is really underknown, and this was a great presentation, George. Thank you, as always. No, no problem. Thank you, Frampton. Thank you, Sean. Yeah, thank you all so much, and we will see you very soon.